So I think I've probably given away my uh, bias in the kind of punchline of my talk as far as, uh, you know, my, my particular interest in understanding molecular mechanisms of disease. And, and, and I'll tell you right up front that I'm trying, I'm going to try to make the case that we need to leverage our new advances in technology and in science to try to find a better way to take care of babies in the NICU. So, but um, first, I think it's worth actually taking a little bit of a survey of what type of babies end up in the NICU. You know, so if we're going to make a case for using new technologies and experimental therapies and all this stuff, we really need to know what we're talking about. So um, there are a number of reasons why babies are end up in the NICU. Uh, some of them will have structural birth defects. And a couple of examples here or are a drawing of a hypoplastic left heart. A lot of these babies are first diagnosed or stabilized in the neonatal ICU before going over to the cardiovascular ICU or having surgery. Um, and most of you will probably recognize that the chest X-ray on the right is not normal. Um, the right uh, or the left hemithorax is full of bowel loops, and this is a, a baby who has congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and those continue to be some of the sickest infants that we care for. So their structural birth defects is one class. Also, there are a lot of babies that are affected by injury or infection. So the baby on the left has had profound hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which is typically caused by lack of blood flow and or oxygen delivery to the brain around the time of birth. The baby on the right is being treated uh, for septic shock from uh, gram-negative bacteremia. So these are certainly types of cases that we have in our unit. We also have a, a myriad of collection of various um, metabolic diseases, if you will, everything from congenital disorders of glycosylation, which is kind of schematized on the left, to disorders of ion channel function and cell physiology, in this case on the right, um, a diagram of what causes long QT syndrome. But the vast majority of babies end up in our NICUs, and this is around the world, are those that are born preterm. And so most of you may know these numbers, but it, I'm still a little bit amazed uh, at the scope of this problem. So 15 million babies are born preterm each year. And this is from the latest WHO uh, survey that I could find. And we're talking about a million deaths a year around the, around the world. A million babies die a year from preterm birth. And not only is it the leading cause of death in newborns, it's actually the leading cause of death in children all the way up to the age of five. So the, the impact of this is huge. I don't think I need to um, you know, sell anybody on that. Um, so the question is, you know, how are we doing with this? And so and is this isolated or is this a problem that the United States has or whatever? So this just like gives you the preterm births in each of the top countries around the world. And you can see the scope of this. And you know, it's not like the US is um, doing as, as well as we should, given our technology and our wealth. So how are we doing though? I mean, we've had NICUs in the United States now for over 50 years. You know, it's been a growing field, a lot of new technology, a lot of advances, a lot of attention giving to the problem. And, and a lot of people are working very hard to try to improve outcomes. And so, so how are we doing with that, all that progress? So this is, these are data from the Vermont Oxford Network, which is a you know, now international group of NICUs and grouped by uh, acuity and class, if you will. And those data are compiled on a regular basis each year. And, and this is actually showing one of the key performance measures that are actually included in this. And so this is mortality of infants born less than 1500 grams. And it's broken down by quartiles. So you can see in the light green, this is the, the median, you know, 50th percentile. This is, you know, right in the middle of how we're doing around the Vermont Oxford network. But I also like to include, these are the best 25%, you know, the best quartile. And this is the 75th percentile. So the different quartiles, so you can see what the range is. So over the last 15 years, the mortality in kids born less than 1,500 grams, if you look in the middle, has been between 10 and 12 percent. And there was a little bit of improvement here for a while, and that would have been great if that would have continued, and you can extrapolate down to maybe 5 percent, but it stabilized and actually has ticked back up a little bit in the last few years. I, I don't know why. You know, I don't know what happened in the last couple of years, but this is, these are the data. And these are, again, from 
state-of-the-art academic cutting edge places, including with all the other types of really, you know, high, um, high level NICUs um, around the area. This is severe intraventricular hemorrhage. And we know that this is one of the major risk factors for poor neurodevelopmental outcome. And again, you can see, if you look at the, the middle quartile, the 50th percentile, we were doing a little bit better between 2005 and 2010, went from 10% down to 8%. And since then it's somewhat stabilized. A little bit better, maybe. Retinopathy of prematurity, uh, you know, obviously the, the major cause of blindness in babies that end up in, uh, in the NICU for prematurity. Again, doing a, maybe a little bit better, um, and, but somewhat stabilized over this period of time. And this is uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So here I am, the guy who's been studying this in the lab for more decades than I care to admit, and actually has very, I have a very big interest in, in improving the clinical care of BPD as well. And have we done anything with the incidence of it? Well, not really. You know, if you look at the last 15 years, it's pretty stable. Um, and, you know, this is a disease that was first characterized here at Stanford. I mean, it's something we should have a lot of pride in actually trying to eradicate from the planet. Um, but for whatever reason, we haven't really made a lot of progress in the last 15 years. And this is with new ventilators, CPAP, new surfactants, new data around surfactant, um, all sorts of uh, bundles that we've tried to put in place to try to improve outcomes. Um, the reality is it's, it's, it's still a major problem. And it's not just the Vermont Oxford Network. So this are um, you know, different international networks or neonatology. These just show the outcomes back to 2007. It's a composite outcome with and without bronchopulmonary dysplasia, just to kind of pull that out, since that's one of the more common ones. And you can see that um, each country is seeing something kind of similar, maybe some improvements here and there, uh, maybe a few places where the outcomes are getting a tad worse, but for the most part, pretty flat. Okay. And this is, and I say flat, we're talking about a situation that causes a million deaths a year around the world. It's the number one cause of death in kids less than five. And over the last 15 years, we really haven't made a lot of progress. Maybe a little, maybe we're getting better. And I've seen some data suggesting that overall neurodevelopmental outcomes in our survivors are probably a little better. So that's very reassuring. Hopefully, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing there. But I think there's an opportunity here for us to do a lot better. And that's what I'm gonna to try to convince you of today is that I think if we are thoughtful and if we are aggressive and open-minded, that the future could be a lot better and we could make some real inroads into how we care for these kids. So we've been always good in neonatology about getting information. So this young attending neonatologist here is examining a patient by also, as we tend to do in the NICU, looking at the monitors. And you can tell um, we've always been pretty good in the NICU about putting lots of machinery and monitors in there. And, and it's a really amazing what we can capture from a small infant regarding their physiology, real time. We can look at organ dysfunction, we can look at response to intervention, and we've been developing these technologies for, again, many decades, and we're getting better and better at them. And so there, there's an opportunity there. However, I think we need to start changing how we use them. And instead of just actually measuring physiology on a real-time basis and deciding how much uh, blood pressure medication or how much oxygen we need to give a baby using this information, we need to start figuring out a way how we can take all this information and actually see how well human development is going. You know, how are our babies doing as far as real growth and development? How can we measure repair following injury, which unfortunately a lot of our babies suffer injury from just exposure to the environment or infection, uh, sometimes real injury, and we'll get into that a little bit, but how do we know how they're doing following that? How do we use this information to project disease risk? And, and if, let's say we find a new treatment or a new cure for something, how are we gonna know that it's working? And can we use this non-invasive tradition of monitoring and information that we've developed in neonatology really to see uh, and understand um, how our efforts are actually progressing.
So some of this work's been pioneered here. And so down on the right, you see Susan Hintz, Vinnie Butani, and Valerie Chalk. Uh, among the, all the many things that that group has done, um, I wanted to highlight a little bit near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, this is not brand new, uh, but we're starting to learn more and more about how it in, um, impacts clinical care. And, and it tells us a little bit more about what's going on with our babies. So it's basically using you know, near-infrared light to measure um, oxygen saturation deep within the tissue. And, and deep enough that we can actually measure oxygen saturation inside the brain, inside the cortex, inside the splanchnic bed. We can get an idea of what's going on in the kidneys. Um, and this is actually now, you know, here, not everywhere, but here, it's actually part of routine clinical care and uh, both in the NICU and in other units as well. And I think it's really, really valuable and really important. And I think it's just kind of scratching the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, um, as far as what this could be used for and what these types of approaches could tell us. So Valerian is not alone in the division. So there's a picture of her and, and Krista Van Mures and Shazia Bambal and um, Sonia Bonifacio, Melissa Scala. They're all interested in taking the different modes that we have, new technologies, and really trying to understand what makes our babies sick, what can make them better <clears throat> in a way that maybe people haven't done before. And this it spans everything from hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, its treatment, how you transport kids when they're really sick to a place like Stanford, um, how do you actually image what's happened to their brain, how well it's developing, uh, and how are they developing overall when exposed to the various things that unfortunately our babies are exposed to in the NICU, like painful procedures, uh, alarms, um, poor sleep, not being held by their mom enough, all these types of things that are important in their overall well-being. There's some new technology coming down. So one of my uh, uh, good friends and uh, now a colleague here at Stanford, Todd Coleman, has developed a non-invasive way to measure um, motility and electrical waves through the stomach. And starting out mainly with, I think about the situation of diabetic gastroparesis in adults. The, the problem with measuring you know, gastrointestinal waves in a non-invasive way is all the noise. There's so many different electrical signals that, it, that can be measured on the, on the abdomen, that it, what really helped Todd's crew do this was a higher order analytic approach to filtering the different signals that they were perceiving. And they were actually able to then get through and just detect the electrical signals coming through the stomach and how the stomach empties. And you can see how it works um, in adults. They, they have made a lot of inroads. Now they have coupled this type of an approach with the development of flexible temporary tattoo sensors, if you will, uh, that his lab has done a lot of great work on. And I know he's got a prototype that works on babies. And so the question is, can we use this type of an approach, not only to look at say the stomach and the waves of uh, uh, peristalsis and electrical signals in the stomach, but the rest of the GI tract, knowing that each part of the GI tract has kind of its own pacemaker signal. You know, can we learn about motility uh, in preterm infants or in term infants. And when babies are in the NICU, how that is normal or abnormal and how it develops with time. And more importantly, can we help it? You know, can we improve it using approaches like this to actually know what we're doing? So we're, there's a lot of new technology out there as far as monitoring. And my hope is, is that not only will it allow us to measure vital signs better, but it will allow us to um, measure the things that we think we need to know uh, to see if we can actually do a better job in taking care of some of these kids. And let's, let's be honest, it's got to be scalable, right? You know, 15 million preterm births worldwide, it doesn't do us any good to have something that only works in the Stanford NICU, right? So it's got to be something that's scalable, it can be widespread and can have a large impact. So now I'm going to get come go from something kind of large and physiological to something very small and very complex, and that's the, the genome. And you know, I'm gonna share my bias again here, that I'm a big fan of genomic sequencing of babies in the NICU. Uh, everyone in the NICU knows this. They've heard me kind of uh, go off on my tangents about them quite a bit, um, but I think that there's a lot of value here. And, and I'll say right up front, I believe that every human should own the information of their genome. They should have control over it and the babies in the NICU and their families should have control over that genomic information. 
But I think they should have it. And hopefully they should share it with their caregivers when we need it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of research opportunities in here too. So I, I'm hoping that we can, um, over time, you know, navigate some of these concerns, potential concerns, and just make sure that genomic information is treated like any other biologic or um, uh, clinical piece of information that helps us take better care of our patients. So, you know, I've been exposed to this uh, in the team down at San Diego. We've been sequencing genomes in the NICU there many years. I know they've been doing it here too as well. And so one of the big advances that happened down in the crew in San Diego with, through a collaboration between Rady Children's and Illumina was just kind of making the whole process go faster. And so there are two things I want to point out here about these two workflows. The first one actually at the top, we get a sequence of genome pretty quickly, but the one on the bottom got it sequenced in a day. And so one of the big differences was going from the HiSeq 2500 to Illumina's new NovaSeq 6000 um, just allowed you to have more capacity and we could sequence more genomes more quickly. Um, and there were a whole bunch of those humming all the time at Silicon Valley Genomic Institute. But one of the other parts was going to the EHR versus using a different approach. And so when we first started sequencing genomes in San Diego, it was clear to all of us that we needed a better job, need to do a better job phenotyping our patients. Hypoglycemia alone would not tell us exactly what was going on and what variants we needed to be looking for. Same with hypoxia or whatever, whatever it is. And so one of the ideas I had was let's go back to Epic and let's make it much more um, you know, database driven in how we put in information using NoteWriter more, using more discrete data fields. And as most of you know that have tried to do things like this in Epic, it's done. It can be done. It's feasible. If it's a little slow and a little cumbersome, and in the end, it really wasn't making much progress. And so the informatics team actually developed a uh, natural language processing approach where they basically said, you guys can type in whatever you want. Don't change your notes at all. Do your problem list, do your diagnoses. The computers will mine it. And so they were basically mining the, the EHR for information that might help connect variant calls to actual clinical scenarios. And that was a huge improvement in the rate at which we could actually get meaningful information from genomes. And this is kind of what a schematic looks like. And so basically, so for example, this patient was admitted for poor feeding, ketonuria, and metabolic acidosis. The natural language processing can go through all the different parts of the, H, um, the EHR, get all the different uh, um, aspects of that that might complement it or might clarify, and then be able to take all the variants that were called at the end of sequencing and then match them up. And, and I think this was actually a a uh, case of uh, maple syrup urine disease that was picked up by sequencing within a day. And so it works. This is Sebastiana. Uh, she was our second kid that we sequenced with intractable seizures. Uh, the first one had been having seizures for probably a week, wasn't responding very well to therapy. Then I finally got her genome sequenced and it took a couple of days to get the results. I think it took us four days to get that call. The process continued to improve. We had Sebastiana's genome done at day two of her life, and uh, she had uh, an ion channel mutation, was switched over to Tegretol and Keppra, and her seizures were controlled, and they still stay controlled to this day. She, comes, she would come around the Genomics uh, Institute offices every once in a while and just uh, say hi to everybody with her family, and, and she's doing very well. So we had a kid with quote-unquote intractable seizures who was still seizing on three medications, the three we usually give in the NICU. And by day two though, by day two of life, we had her diagnosis and we had her on the right therapy. You know, that's, that, that, and that's just one case. So th this was something that was happening almost on a daily basis. It also helps in things that we, I honestly didn't think it would. And so this just uh, highlights a, a group of uh, patients with congenital heart disease in our NICU. And this study was actually led by Natalie Sweeney, a Stanford alum. Um, and, and what she found is about, in about half, about half the kids with congenital heart disease in this cohort, there was a variant that, um, that was identified. Most of the cases, there are the sets of trials we've done, it's about a third. But in congenital heart disease cases, it was half. And, um, and sometimes it helped us um, just understand the diagnosis. Some, there were a few cases that um, by getting the genomic diagnosis, we, it led us to recommend palliative care and be able to do it much more quickly than maybe we would have um, in the past. 
There were a couple of interesting stories though. Like there was one kid who was having calcium and phosphorus abnormalities and was diagnosed with, um, you know, X-linked hypophosphatemic syndrome. It was put on the right therapy and was stabilized there. And so before bone bony changes were detected. So I think that's pretty good. Um, there was also a kid who had congenital heart disease. Um, I think had been repaired uh, or at least a palliation um, if I remember right, and was, but was still had severe cholestasis and they actually did a liver biopsy and it showed, um, you know, a, a really abnormal uh, finding, you know, could be consistent with um, a biliary atresia and just with hyperproliferation, all the small bowel ducts. And so the kid was actually scheduled for a Kasai procedure and it was the morning of surgery. I kid you not, that morning we got the diagnosis back of a JAG1 mutation. So the kid had allergial syndrome and didn't have all the other classic um, some uh, signs is, you know, allergies has, some, you know, variable penetrance, but the reassuring thing there is that the cholestasis and liver uh, problems and allergies at birth often resolve on their own. And so this kid avoided a Kasai procedure, like with hours to spare, literally, uh, and uh, slowly got better just with conservative management. So it works. So if you get genomic diagnoses on kids, you can improve their care. About our experience has been about a third of the time we get a diagnosis. It's a diagnosis with a, a documented in the literature variant that correlates with their presenting signs. And in about half of those kids, we actually change the way we manage them. So they, um, they you know, if we're going to do this on all kids, we need to be thoughtful about uh, how much it costs, whether or not it's scalable, like I said. And so one of the studies that the team down at Rady did was this Project Baby Bear, where they did five different uh, children's hospitals around the state, looking at uh, getting the state to fund it, just looking at the overall impact of it, could it be replicated? And again, still about, about a third of the time, we got an answer. Um, and then the cost savings per child was interesting. What they actually did this, they looked at rapid whole genome sequencing versus maybe the, the typical turnaround costs. And what I wanted to highlight here is the cost savings per child. And there's a low and a high range here, because depending on how much the impact of the sequence and this answer changes their clinical care. So obviously there's gonna be a range. But per child, uh, getting a rapid whole genome sequence, three-day turnaround, uh, saved between 12 to $15,000 uh, per case. The longer you go out, and so if you send it through maybe routine sequencing and analysis uh, pipelines, seven days or 14 days, the cost savings is much less. And, and at the time this study was done, it was costing us about 8,500 bucks, I think, maybe $9,000 to do a genome. So it saves money. And that's why insurance companies are approving it. That's why the state is hopefully gonna start approving it. Um, and um, it's why we need to be doing it more. I wanted to go ahead and be very open though about the inclusion and exclusion criteria here. And so these were the inclusion criteria for this study. And I wanna highlight a couple of things on the exclusion. So, um, we have not been routinely sequencing the genomes for kids that are in the NICU only for prematurity and without any other complications or any you know, signs that don't seem to completely normal. Um, infection and sepsis with normal response to therapy, you know, that was excluded. HIE with a clear precipitating event. Now that gets a little bit tricky because that clear precipitating event is sometimes hard. And they're actually doing a study now where they're taking all kids with HIE on a national uh, study to look at their genomic sequencing to see if that helps at all. And a few other things that we think are probably, uh, you know, probably not related to genomics. My argument is, is that until we sequence the genome of all of these kids too, and see what kind of variants they have and how that might impact their clinical course, we don't know if there's going to be high yield there or not. So I think that, um, you know, that's going to be the next challenge to really see, you know, where does the benefit extend? We have a great team here at Stanford that, you know, that uh, is doing these studies all the time too. And the group down in San Diego benefited a lot from the collaborations up here. Um, and so I think that we have done some great work. I'm excited to see that John's going to be presenting on the Undiagnosed Disease Network uh, study coming up soon. I look forward to that. But I think that we actually have the potential here to do rapid genome sequencing uh, on, cl on critically ill patients, not just in the NICU, but or out the hospital in a in faster and more clinically impactful way than anyone has done it before. And so we are poised and well positioned to be able to bring this technology directly into the, to the bedside and have it make a big difference in how we care for patients.
So one of the things I haven't yet talked about is this idea of, you know, what do you sequence? And so most of our understanding about, you know, how genetic variants affect, um, you know, physiology or biological function, um, you know, has been based on, on the central dogma of biology, right? That you get a change in the DNA, that leads to a change in the mRNA sequence, and you get a peptide mutation. And that mutation in that peptide uh, that protein affects how well enzymes work or whether or not receptors can actually bind to their ligand and signal appropriately, whether or not a transcription factor can function, all of these things leading to disease, right? Well, it's obviously not that simple because all of this quote unquote dark DNA and junk DNA is rich with important features. And so one of the things that personally I've been more and more interested in late in the lab, and I, I feel embarrassed that we weren't studying this 20 years ago, are um, gene enhancer regions. And so these are regions of the DNA that do not code for protein, not made into RNA. They could be millions of bases away, right? Um, but they contain regions that bind transcription factors. And these, in binding these transcription factors controls the gene transcription. And there are a lot of variants in these regions. And so here's an example of a variant that can cause uh, relative changes in how well this enhancer works. And so it can change the transcription and you get difference in message levels, even though it's not a coding variant. You can also change whether or not that area of the DNA is open, has open chromatin or is silenced by epigenetic changes. And so it affects um, you know, gene regulation in that way too. The, these happen, these are very common throughout our genomes. And uh, there are many, many biological examples, including examples where changes in an enhancer can affect how well a gene is expressed in different cell types. So here's three different generic cells. The same enhancer region will bind different transcription factors in those different cells, leading to give different levels of gene expression and a different impact of that variant. And we see this in the NICU all the time. I don't know if we always appreciate it, but there are so many um, situations where we probably or definitely have a genetic variant that affects every organ differently. And, and one of the things I love to kind of think about, because it's just, it just, yeah, just hard to comprehend, are ciliary diseases. So remember, every cell in the body has a primary cilia, at least does at one point in its life. And that's addition to the modal cilia that you know, think about in ciliated cells. And these cilia are important for lots of signaling pathways. The number of signaling pathways that use cilia or localize their receptors or components to the cilia is really unbelievable. You know, anything Wnt signaling, TGF beta signaling, mTOR signaling, NF kappa B, um, of course, sonic hedgehog signaling is very, you know, uh, really tightly regulated by ciliary function. And there's more. And, and look at all the different syndromes that we see that have cilia at their kind of basis. And, and, and every one of these kids has a little bit different uh, uh, manifestation of the disease in the different organs. And so not only do we really need to know the whole genome in our patients, we need to start thinking about how do we understand um, the somatic impact of those uh, variants? You know, what is, it, what is it doing in the heart versus the brain or versus the kidney? And are there ways that we can measure that? Or based on the actual, can we just actually take the variant calls off of you know, the DNA sequence from any tissue or any sample, and then know enough to understand how it might be impacted in different tissues. That's really, could be really, really important. So it's not just the genome though. So one of the things that we're, I, I'm constantly trying to remind trainees is that most of our kids are not diseased or the day they enter the NICU. It's that they're un immature. And during the course of normal human development, they go off track and their development doesn't progress as normally as it might if they'd stayed healthy inside mom. And that's when we get a lot of the complications of prematurity. So this gets really complicated, right? So everyone has their genome, which kind of lays the blueprint of the different variants they have, which allows them to have all the features of their who they are and how they might respond and be healthy or not. But then there's all the things that are related to that. There's, of course, the measuring protein production, which is important in the proteome, uh, environmental influences, which are huge in the NICU, because obviously the environment in the NICU, although the best we try is never going to be like it is in mom. 
um, the metabolome, and which is you know is a much larger idea than what the name gives it credit for. Because thinking about it's not just metabolism in a, in a simplistic way about how well mitochondria work, whether or not you're using glycolysis or not. It's all the different molecules that are produced within the body that regulate physiology, function, and development. And so you can imagine how complex that gets. You, you can focus just on lipids. You can focus just on steroids, amino acids, um, you know, energy metabolites, you know, mitochondrial metabolites. A whole, you, know, you can imagine. It's very, very complicated. All of these contribute to the patient's phenotype. So luckily, we can measure all of these things now. And so this is a slide that was shared to me from you know, uh, the crew here. You know, the team here at Stanford we routinely measures all of these different things. You know, not only in the sequence in the genome, measuring immune cell function and identity, looking at proteomes and the metabolome, looking at the microbiome. Uh, not only the microbiome as far as which bacteria are in your gut or on your skin or in any other organ, but what are they doing? What are they making? How are they influencing your own uh, body? Uh, the epigenome, which is, I hinted at a little bit, whether or not you have open chromatin or closed chromatin throughout your body, whether or not that's accessible, or what the methylation and acetylation uh, patterns are, uh, whether or not that just goes with aging, or whether or not it's something that's plastic. And of course, the transcriptome, which is even harder to measure clinically, uh, except for maybe blood samples, and actually seeing which mRNA molecules are truly made. And then, then like I said, the expososome, which for us might be pollution and the things we encounter, kids in the NICU, it's obviously something very, very different. So this just kind of um, highlights some of the people here that are doing these kind of work. So we're getting this information now, and we are starting to learn more about how all of these data interact and both in different patients and how they can kind of correlate with uh, clinical outcomes. And it takes a huge team to do this type of science. It takes a lot of uh, really great science uh, a lot of integration, a lot of informatics. And so these are huge data sets and it's how we put them together and, and match them up with clinical scenarios that I think is really important. Just wanna give a few examples here. So this Carl Sylvester's team has done some really nice work, mainly focused around necrotizing enterocolitis in the NICU. And this is just showing uh, a sample of data, um, you know, some things that they found in longitudinal studies of patients in the NICU that either end up getting neck or not and, and trying to identify some molecular uh, signatures of, of this disease risk. Nima Agipur and his group have um, kind of challenged what we know about, you know, when is a baby term or when are they preterm and looking at the complications of prematurity. And I think we probably all knew this or sensed it, but Nima's group did a really nice job at actually measuring it. And so instead of trying to draw these different boxes and lines, which is like 28 weeks, 37 weeks, Here's the actual distribution of patients, you know, and their complications. And you can see, yeah, there's a, a lot more, you know, kids that are, you know, older who are healthy and not in any complications. And then the, you know, the, some of these uh, complications of prematurity are a little bit more prevalent, lower. But, it, you know, obviously there's, a, there's gradients and every patient is unique. And we always see a patient that's a little older than and it gets a complication of prematurity. And, and we think that's kind of weird. We shouldn't, we didn't expect that. And then we see some kids that are very immature that do quite well and are very resilient to disease and, and don't have those complications. Here's an example. I love, I love kind of walking through some of these models. And so, for example, they took this whole large data set of information of all the metabolomic information they got over time and then looked at the, some of the different components of that, you know, tyrosine metabolism, different fatty acids, free carnitine. And by building a model, they were actually able then to develop these subgroups of risk and risk of different complications. And you know, this is another example of some of the more common pathways that were more likely to be uh, seen in patients developing these different disease risks um, being born premature. The amazing thing is that they can get some of this information from mom before she delivers. They can get some of this information at birth and some of this information after birth. So, and after, as a kid is in the NICU. And so there really is a continuum here of potential risk and changes in metabolism and setting up patients for disease processes that we really don't yet understand. But now we're starting to kind of, again, scratch the surface a little bit. And, and so the next thing would be to try to see is, you know, 
well, how can we how can we help this? How can we intervene? Here? And this is actually, you know, this is actually an illustration of an, another project where, you know, looking at everything within the, the EHR and all the information we get, all the labs, all the procedures of moms while they're pregnant up until birth and then afterwards, you know, and then kind of putting this all together and finding potential exposures or treatments that mom receives before she delivers um, around that time and really trying to understand things in a way that maybe we didn't in the past. And I think, and that's the important thing. I think we need to own the fact that we can do better and have an open mind about what are, how are we managing our patients and is there a way we can do better? Here's another wide open field, I think, and this is the gut brain axis. This is the kind of diagram. So again, we know that the microbiome is important. And so uh, the more and more we learn about the microbiome, the more we think that it's probably controlling everything. But one of the things that the, the gut microbiome does is it actually does play a role in production of neurotransmitters in the body. And so those neurotransmitters from the gut do actually go to the brain. And of course, the brain then has influence back on the gut as well. And so the question is, how does this happen during development? You know, we've mainly been studied in adults uh, and older children, but what's going on in a preterm infant? How is this system working? And is there a way to make sure that it happens the right way? Or if it's not happening the right way, can we correct it? This is a paper just came out in Cell, and I just showed the, the kind of the diagram from it. This is a really intriguing idea that the immune system has memory that's hardwired in the cortex. So in this study, what they showed is that severe inflammatory um, processes in the either peritoneum or in the, in the gut, actually the, the response to that inflammation was stored within neurons in the insular cortex. And then after the inflammation had resolved, those neurons, when activated, could replicate peripheral inflammation. So those mice actually got peritonitis or colitis without any injury to their peripheral body just by activating that part of the brain. So it is all in your head, and it's also everywhere else. And so the finding out these mechanisms, I think, is really important. And again, how does this happen when your cortex is still developing? Babies in the NICU often are exposed to multiple inflammatory episodes. Well, maybe are they really all infectious, or are some of these actually immune memory that's coming back? I don't know. So but we owe it to them to try to figure this out. So again, it's about understanding how we can avoid these complications of prematurity by ensuring that we get normal development along this lifespan. And so in my, in my lab, we're interested in lung development. And so, um, you know, the lung is very immature in a lot of the kids that are admitted to the NICU for prematurity. And in a lot of these kids, the overall lung maturation fails to occur normally, and they end up with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Well, we've learned over the years that inflammation is a major player in this disease. And what it probably does, and rather than injuring the lung, it actually just basically um, kind of removes the normal developmental wiring system uh, for lung development. And so when the lung responds to inflammation, the signaling pathways now are not conducive for normal development. And macrophages are the key uh, inflammatory cell that does this. And the and macrophages in the lung of a preterm infant are not the same as the macrophages in the lung of an adult. And so we did a large study looking at babies in the NICU who are intubated, looking at their lung macrophage gene expression. And, and just kind of going through the data, we found a couple of interesting patterns. And I'm just showing one gene. This is macrophage scavenger receptor one. And what we found is that, you know, we had a fair number of kids who were very immature on the ventilator, um, on the ventilator for several weeks, who ended up not getting BPD or had very mild disease. So they were off oxygen by the time they went home. And the expression of this gene MSR1 is interesting because it's pretty low at, at day one, but then it goes up by day seven and it stays up kind of. But in the kids with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the pattern was different. It didn't, didn't go up as much between day one and day seven. It was more scatter uh, and it stayed kind of low. And it, it wasn't alone. There were other genes with this pattern as well. And we, in, without knowing any better, we called these uh, resilience genes genes that correlate with a baby's ability to avoid bronchopulmonary dysplasia that go up between day one and day seven. So I was actually dumb enough to start going through all of our data, looking for this pattern one at a time. Luckily, Debasha Sahu down in San Diego, who another Stanford alum, uh, had a better idea. 
And he uses Boolean approaches to actually mine large data sets. And he said, we can use a program that he developed called StepMiner to look for these different patterns to see when genes go up or down over time and see if that correlates with outcome. And that's what he found. And so this is an example of these resilient genes. So these are the kids who got you know, no BPD or a mild disease. A lot of genes went up between day one and day seven, like I showed you. There was also a few genes that went up uh, between uh, two and three weeks of life. And then another set of genes that went down after the first day of life. And so you could look at these and, and now we're trying to mine these, this data set to look at uh, what those genes are. When we looked at the kids with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia, there were fewer genes and the patterns weren't quite as clear, but they were still all there. Okay, so maybe they're just doing the same thing, just to a different degree. But when we looked at the genes, the actual genes, they're very different. Of all the genes that have these patterns, only 58 were shared between kids with resilient to disease and kids with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And if we take the genes that had a pattern over time in the kids who didn't develop severe BPD, and we looked at their expression in the severe BPD patients, this is what you see. It's pretty much low throughout time. So those kids don't acquire the expression of those quote unquote resilience genes. Well, so what? Well, we are interested in how, um, how genes become transcribed or not. And so again, it goes back to enhancer regions, promoter regions, transcription factors that mediate the expression of all these different genes. And if we could identify how this works, how these genes are turned on, maybe then there's a therapeutic option. And so one of the first things we did is we looked at the enhancer regions and promoter regions that were predicted to bind transcription factors in these different gene sets. And, and this, we saw some differences. And so the kids who are quote unquote resilient, the genes that they expressed uniquely over time are predicted to bind this set of transcription factors in their promoter enhancer regions. And these are not necessarily transcription factors that are known to regulate gene expression in macrophages. There's a few, few interesting stories in here. And fat C2 is really cool because you know, it's, its role in uh, regulating morphogenesis of a lot of different organs and health there. But we're still, we are, now we're actually going back and doing the biology to try to understand how do you activate these transcription factors? What sort of pathways are involved? In the kids with severe BPD, NF-kappa B activation, we knew was important for inflammation. And we had some interesting data in mice that the connections between NF-kappa B and SP proteins might be playing a role in hijacking normal developmental mechanisms. So that's an interesting thing that we're looking at as well. And then the role of, of MYC and MYC signaling and MYC-mediated transcription is also something that really hasn't been studied in BPD pathogenesis in detail, but we're going to look at that now. So the idea is to take all this information, you know, all these different multi-omic studies and bring it back to something that tastes as good as amoxicillin, and we can just give it to every single kid that needs it. And, and then hopefully by thinking about this and trying to take a new approach, uh, we can do better. And so I think that that's the challenge and that we all as a field own it, and that we have to try to think about how we're doing things and what it is it that we don't know and uh, how can we challenge ourselves to do better for our kids? So thank you very much and um, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Lance. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I was a little technical difficulty. Okay, well, first of all, I thought with, that was extraordinary for many reasons. So the first is that I'm track on the participants and you've reached participants all over the department and in the school far and wide. I also knew how amazing your work, your work was as relates to lung disease. Um, and I knew there was so much enthusiasm, you know, Mark Nichols and Tushar Desai and, and others in getting you here, but the reach has been incredible. I'm also so happy to see how it connects to the, the UDN. I think the fact that you said a third of patients had a genetic diagnosis um, that, you know, that uh, it was really informative. And I think that's about the rate that the UDN sees with half <coughs> going on to have changes in, you know, therapy because of it. Um, the other thing is one of the key elements of, of the integrated strategic plan across uh, all of Stanford medicine is uniquely Stanford and the number of investigators that your work touches, I think is a great example of that. So next year when the Dean asks me for examples, I know which one will be front and center. Okay, so we had some good questions. The first is 
could the ECG, EEGG technique be used to monitor and prevent neck? You, I think that question came early and you did talk about uh, neck a little bit later, but maybe yeah. expand so on that. That, that was, um, that's the ultimate goal. And I think initially we were just going to see if could it connect with, uh, you know, feeding tolerance, right? So whether or not babies have normal motility, could we then advance feeds more quickly in some kids versus others? Um, and then, you know, whether or not motility of the GI tract and coordinated motility plays a role in the pathogenesis of neck, we don't know yet. So that's exactly the sort of thing that we need to figure that out figure out and, um, and it may or it may not but it, it regardless it's something we have the potential now to actually uh, test and actually see what, what we can learn. Okay great why only Medi-Cal patients and Project Baby Bear? It was funded by the state for that reason so oh, that's just, that particular that particular project was a state-funded uh, study but uh, there have been a lot of other studies that have found pretty similar or comparable uh, results, you know, remembering that the cost of sequencing comes down every day. And so um, th that part of it is always going to move. But, you know, it's not just the sequencing, right? It's also the, the cost is also the um, interpretation, the variant calls, making sure that you have the infrastructure to, um, you know, have this be actionable. Oh, great. Okay. Anyone at Stanford looking at heterogeneity in intracellular motors in kinesins as it affects phenotypes? Ooh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> if anybody knows of anybody, let me know. I think yeah. that would, uh, uh, I think that'd be really, really cool. I mean, and just, uh, again, I remember when one of my colleagues who was studying, he was actually studying polycystic kidney disease, and he was trying to convince me that cilia were important in every single cell in the body. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Cilia just clear mucus. That's all they do. And, um, and, but he kept showing me this data and, and, uh, and, then, and then the field started to really grow. And I was like, well, I feel pretty stupid. You're right. Um, uh, and it's, but it's, it's biologically, it's really interesting to think about how all signaling doesn't just happen globally within a cell. It's always localized to these specific areas. And if you think about cilia are important for determining the very, very first steps of sightedness in the development of the embryo, then all the other signaling pathways that it uh, that they play a role in. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. I, I, I'd love to hear more about what people are doing here in that area. Yeah. So that was comment came from an anonymous attendee. So maybe they'll show themselves. The other yeah. thing is you mentioned how important cilia are to kidneys. They're actually incredibly important in the bone where they are the mechanosensors that's mm. weight bearing activity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. Um, has anyone looked at the genes that were identified in the severe BPD group to see if these are present in patients, regardless of age, with severe COVID-19, regardless of perinatal history? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I, um, hmm. Huh, that's interesting. A lot of the genes that we see that are higher in the severe BPD patients, uh, a lot of them are inflammatory genes, right? So they're inflammatory mediators. However, it's never quite that simple, right? It's not just inflammatory media. Because, you know, you think about the case, we were very interested in IL-1 beta and continue to be. You know, IL-1 beta has some therapeutic, um, you know, uh, um, drugs that you can intervene with. But um, IL-1 beta is also one of the major signals of telling the immune system to shut off and promote eventual repair. So if you completely block IL-1 beta, you end up running the risk of having persistent inflammation, even though you may not give it such a severe initial one. And then, and then one of the things that really fascinates me is it seems like every microbe has their own different inflammatory signature that it can potentially cause. And it's not the microbe, it's, a, it's the host generally, right? It's our inability to kill off whatever microbe that we don't want and then resolve inflammation normally. And, and I think you know, if you, that's why all the initial try to, uh, attempts to lump COVID in with quote unquote cytokine storm, like you would see in HLH patients, didn't fit. It was a little different. And it's the dysregulation of, say, interferon versus some other um, uh, pathways that are giving it its unique disease and, and, and the cellular side too, right? It, it tends to affect the vasculature more. So I didn't answer your question. We don't yet know if there is any overlap between BPD pathogenesis and, uh, and COVID syndrome, the inflammatory syndrome in the lungs of after COVID. Um, there's, got, there's going to be some overlap because it's, there's such immense inflammation. But as far as anything more specific that, than that, I, I don't know. But it'd be a, it's a really interesting idea. Okay. And revealing that I'm a card carrying bonehead, IL-1 beta is important in bone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Oops. I think we have one more question. Um, all right. 
Uh, I think these are amazing questions, Lance, in terms of how transdisciplinary they are. Are there any peculiar peculiarities about mitochondrial genomics that make it more or less useful for this type of scrutiny and potential interventions compared to nuclear genomics? <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, it, it's really intriguing. I mean, there are ways that you can look at the mitochondrial genome now, as most people know, and, and, and the inheritance in the mitochondrial genome is different, right? So that, that yeah. opens up some interesting paradigms. And, and it's, it's got to, you know, we know it, you know, there are kids that have mitochondrial disorders, correct, right? So that's all, that's all known. The impact of that, though, um, and how we do it in, in routinely, um, you know, I don't know. I think that's a really interesting idea. And it kind of also kind of fits with the part of the metabolism that we generally don't get into. And that is, you know, the cells in the body that are, you know, using their mitochondria and mitophagy and, and ones that aren't, you know, and in, in the area that I work in, a lot of these inflammatory macrophages practice aerobic glycolysis, the Wardenberg effect, and they don't use their mitochondria when they're activated because they want to quote unquote preserve biomolecules for inflammation. I don't know what that means, but there's a lot that needs to be understood there. Um, but uh, that's intriguing, you know, because th it would be really interesting to look at mitochondrial genomics in kids who don't have obvious mitochondrial disorders, because it would be really interesting to learn about what might be there. Great. I, I think that's amazing. And I can't think of a Grand Rounds that sparked so many new collaborations. So I hope everybody that's interested in this will be quick to contact you. I think your dance card is yeah. going to be very full. Great. Come on. Right. I'll show you around. Yeah. Good. All right. That's the end of our hour. Thank you so much, Lance. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.